I've often made it a habit over the years when I'm sitting in an audience where someone else is preaching or in a Bible class, not only just to learn from what is said, but also to be thinking as certain things are said or pointed out or certain observations made that cause me to think about a sermon. And uh, when we are being guided over the weeks as we have been by Brother Cohn in our study of the book of Hebrews, and we have gotten into the 11th chapter, studied much about faith and that it's an obedient faith that saves us, and gone back to these Old Testament characters who never knew a thing about the New Testament. And yet, for their day and their age, they were faithful to whatever God directed them because every one of those begins by faith, such and such. But I noticed one that I hadn't thought a lot about from the standpoint of a lesson that might be there, though I understood the message that's there. And that is in Hebrews 11 and verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And that made me want to look a little more at that. And I'll show you why as we go through this. Uh, We know then from this passage that the inspired Hebrews writer, the same Holy Spirit that inspired Moses to write about Enoch in the first place, tells us of his faith. We know from a study of the Scriptures, specifically a common passage to us all, Romans 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Thus, this man had heard the will of God for his day and time, And since he acted by faith, he was then doing what God required of them. He certainly knew the principle that's true, whether it's the patriarchal age, mosaical age, or the Christian age, that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. And also in the New Testament, we learn about him in Jude 1 and verse 14. And we learn that he was a prophet. Scripture reads, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. A prophet is a fourth teller. He is a person who speaks only the words God puts in his mouth to speak. Somebody has said he's like the old terminology used by the gangs about their lawyer. Prophet is the mouthpiece of God. He's to say nothing but what God reveals to him to say. So he primarily was a teacher, as all prophets were. So I learned something about him there. But I don't want to end up with those and what is said in verse 5, other than emphasize that when Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight that that certainly applied to Enoch. Remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Well, if we walk by faith and not by sight, then we're walking as the word of God leads, guides, and directs us. So he certainly could be described as one who walked by faith and not by sight because it was by faith that the scripture says Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now, with all that before us, I want us to go back and read Genesis 5. Verses 21 through 23. And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch was 365 years. Verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Therein, I want to focus. I want to notice Enoch's walk with God. In the light of what we've already said from the Hebrew epistle, by faith Enoch was thus and so, 
and that he was a prophet of God. So in this sermon, in doing that, Enoch's walk with God, I want to study several things that are implied about this man Enoch, who we already know is a faithful man, that Moses had to say about him. I say implied, what we can milk from these verses that will help you and me to be faithful to God today, and if you please, to do as Enoch did. Walk with God. First of all, we would see that this implies his conduct. Now, all of us do things. All of us are active in certain things to a certain extent. That's our conduct. So what does proper conduct entail? The question should be, are you prepared to walk with God? Which tells me Enoch had to be preparing himself to do what the Scripture says he did. Well, you know, that didn't begin just with him because the Scripture is full of material regarding the responsibility of parents. In Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, that doesn't teach the impossibility of apostasy. It does teach, when you look at the Hebrew especially, in the way he should go means literally according to the tenor of his way. Some parents make mistakes at times because they try to make their children over in their own mold. I think particularly that has to do with fathers who want their boys to be the best football players or baseball players in the world, and they just know that when they get grown, they'll be known as a star in the major leagues. Rarely happens. Especially if that child's bent is toward books or toward music or toward something like that. What is being said here in Proverbs 22.6 is parents... Yes, genetically, he's from you and all your genetic line. But he also has a spirit fathered by God that bears that imprint. And you need to recognize, even if you have ten kids, you need to recognize some may just have a natural bit, is the way we say it, a natural inclination to go a certain way. And don't try to make him go away. He's not naturally inclined to be sensible enough and wise enough and that's what he's saying here, to direct him in that way. Now, of course, you would be, if you do that, uh, better helping him to get ready to receive the gospel. But this is not a passage that talks about, here's a way to guarantee your kid won't go to hell. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do, because there is no passage that teaches that. That is the impossibility of apostasy. It's impossible to find that passage for the simple reason it's not there. <laughs> this is talking about parents being wise in rearing their children. Christian parents are taught to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's spiritual emphasis. And to how they can uh, make a living in life and make a living here getting ready for heaven. But in making that living in life, some may have a bent toward athletics. Some may have a bent toward whatever it might be. Now, in your mind, you may say, I don't like him being that. I don't even think about that. I don't know why sometimes parents have done this for years. will look at their little children and say, what are you going to be when you grow up? All the time, they're hoping that they will admit they want to be what mom and daddy, or at least daddy, wants them to be. But they may say, I want to be a witch doctor. Well, I don't know what they're going to do about that because they don't realize it's a child speaks as a child, and when he becomes a man, he puts away childish things. But there is a bent, if you want to call it that, to every one of us as children. So that's what's being said there. Enoch was reared, I think we can say, in his day and age with the revelation of God available to them so that he would be a man of faith. So there's personal preparation. Personal preparation. What about you? He had to consider the cost to serve God in that bygone age. Jesus taught about that in Luke 14, beginning verse 28, the verses following. 
We sing a song sometimes, have we counted the cost? Are we willing to count the cost of what it means if I faithfully serve God all my life? What I'll give up, what I'll take on, who I'll associate with, how will I conduct myself, how will I think, what will I read? Oh, yes, it covers all of that. There has to be the effort made. There has to be the planning and purposing of the mind and the self-control. In Ezra 7, in verse 10, the scripture reads, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. But not just to intellectually fill his mind with the law of the Lord. Notice, to seek the law of the Lord and do it. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. To know God's will, but not just to know it, but to put it into practice. That's the reason you're learning it in the first place. And part of that practice would be, I want to teach others to walk the straight and narrow way too. That's what Ezra did. That's part of the preparation. That's the effort that ought to be put into it. We can see that because Enoch walked with God and what all that implies. There's also the trust in God that he had as he walked with God. We could say a companion with God. That he trusted in God to take care of him. Take care of those things he couldn't do a thing in the world about. In Genesis 15 verse 20, notice what Joseph said. When he's revealing himself to his brothers concerning their selling him down into Egypt. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. Now watch. But God meant it unto good. For what purpose? To bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. What a thought. That evil can come upon me and people can mean to do evil to me. But if I stay true to that book, I continue to walk with God. Doors will be opened. As I said in class this morning. My way will be directed. Well, I just don't see how I can do it. Yeah, but you're not God. (laughs) My trust is in God. I walk with God. My faith is in God and His way. He will take care of me. So I have to practice it. I have to keep on keeping on. It's not a one-time action. It is continual obedience. He's the author of eternal salvation, Jesus is, unto all them that obey him. So I know this walk with God was him obeying God, doing what God told him the way he told him for the reason he told him. In James 1 and verse 22, we have that same admonition to you and me as members of the church. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Enoch wasn't a hearer only. Because if he had been, he would have deceived himself. That's what James says happens to us when we know this is what God requires of me. I don't do it. I don't do it. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Back over in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 28, 20. And David, concerning the building of the temple and how David was forbidden to do it, Solomon was the one God wanted to do it. And David said to Solomon, his son, and this is necessary for everybody that will walk with God. Not just in this given situation in the building of the temple by Solomon. Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, David says, will be with thee. Notice, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. I take that and apply it to us, living day by day faithful to God. He'll not fail us. He'll not forsake us. He'll always be there for us. The doors will be open. He may close some doors, but he may open others. All the days of our life. In other words, until we have finished our course on earth. However that ends and whenever that may be. Ezra 10 and verse 4, you have the same admonition. Be of good courage, but notice, and do it. Perseverance. So the question I ask myself, will you continue to walk with God? Will you continue to walk with God? God's prepared works 
that we should walk in them according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. The good works that are characteristic of godly people in the church. We're to walk worthily of the calling wherewith we were called, Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 1. And he also said we're to walk as children of light, Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Light being truth, darkness being error. In Ephesians 5.15, we are to walk carefully, not as unwise, but wise. And then to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. Notice, furthermore, got more to add to what he just finished. Furthermore, then we beseech, we're on bended knee begging you, as it were, brethren, and exhort you, do what you already know God enjoins upon you. By the Lord Jesus, not just by me as an apostle of Christ, but it's Jesus that wants you to do this. That as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Notice he uses the same terminology, walk, as you ought to walk, which means as you ought to live, as you ought to conduct yourself, proper conduct before the Lord. A faithful life, a life of walking by faith and not by sight. Walking is the word of God leads and guides and directs us. That's the first thing I would say that was involved, all these little subpoints also there, in Enoch walking with God. Then what about his fellowship? The question I ask myself, are we on God's side? I wonder if Enoch ever asked that and examining himself. I don't know he did in some way or the other because we all as free moral agents, intellectual creatures, rational creatures, all on trial before God in this fleshly body, we have to ask ourselves, am I on God's side? Am I staying faithful to him? Am I teachable? Is my heart tender? When I see I'm wrong, will I change? So when we might say, when the roll's called, in this life, when the roll's called, will we be able honestly to answer present and ready to work? Or as the prophet of old said, here am I, send me. Do we seek association with God? Now, by this, I simply mean do we attend the regularly scheduled assemblies of the saints, assemblies of exhortation, wherein we worship God, and in each avenue of worship, we're being encouraged and strengthened and exhorting to keep on keeping on, being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't you know that must have been on his mind? It was, was his labor in vain in the Lord? That is, he was on God's side, wasn't he? Hebrews 10, 25. He didn't have the same obligations to discharge as we do. As I said, he's in the patriarchal age. He, has, he knows nothing of all those things that went on with the Jews or the law of Moses. Certainly nothing about the New Testament system. But he knew to pray. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Think he did? If he walked with God, well, certainly he did. And to study whatever he had of God's word, whatever revelation from God concerning how he should think and speak and act. You think he kept that on his mind in some way or the other? as we're to do, Acts 17 and 11. I need to ask the question, is God my closest companion? Are those with which we are most closely associated Christians? People who have loved the truth and from the heart obeyed the truth and are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, who are strengthening us to be what the Bible says we ought to be. In Acts 17, 6, those outside of Christ, those who were upset at the gospel, said Paul and his company had come there, said these, these have come to us who've been coming around different places throughout the world that have turned the world upside down. And we've, we've known they were really turning it right side up because they taught them the way to live and rebuke their error. Do we exemplify Christ in our lives? Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and 1 Corinthians 11, 1, say, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Yes, we should be patterns of godliness to others. 
I don't know how to do that if I don't do what the Lord told me. I don't know how to set that good example if I don't live according to the teaching of the New Testament. If, to sum it up, I don't practice pure and undefiled religion. James 1, 27. Do we help God in how we live, how we think, what we do, who we associate with as we walk with him? Because that's what you would do if you walk with him as a companion. Or do we hide from him? Think about Adam and Eve. They were God's companions walking with him in the cool of the evening in the garden until they sinned. Then they tried to hide from him. That's the way it's always been when people are guilty of sin and know it and know they need to change. So the question is, where are we, we walking in our relationship to God, our fellowship? Are we walking behind God? I would call that the sin of omission, leaving undone what God obligates us to do. I will say again, because it needs to be said, every judgment parable the Lord gave showed people being sent to perdition because they left undone what God said they ought to do. But most of the time, we measure whether we're acceptable to God or not on the basis of what we don't do. And as Brother Wood used to say, just add up a column of zeros. What do you get at the column of zeros? Brett, what do you get when you add up a column of zeros? You're the accountant right here I'm looking at. Zero. Zero. So I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with the girls that do and I don't and I don't and I don't. Well, all right, fine and good. What replaces those things? It's the doing of what God enjoins upon us. And the reason I believe firmly that the Lord showed in the judgment parables those who were lost or those who left undone what God expected them to do to be faithful is because it is so easy for us to overlook the things we ought to be doing. Therefore, James wrote, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. James 4 and verse 17. Can't get plainer than that. Do you think that ever impacted Enoch? Do you think he was concerned about those things? Could he really be described accurately as walking with God if the things we've been studying here were not incorporated to his life as a part of his everyday living? Are we walking, maybe we should say, rather than behind God, letting that represent sins of omission, are we walking in front of them? We we'll call that sin of commission. John had this to say, remember he wrote this to Christians, two, Second John 9, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. When I know God enjoins this upon me and I just violate it, I just break it. Such as Adam did when he partook of the forbidden fruit. He knew better, but he did it anyway. Then that's a sin of commission. So maybe I should ask, because there are a lot of people today that want to loose us from what God and his word is bound on us to give us greater freedom and liberty than the word does. But God knows what we need better than we do, so we love the restrictions of God. It keeps us out of scrapes that we don't need to be in. And he knows how to guide us if we will simply submit to his will. So are we walking next to God, not behind him, not in front of him, but next to him? John, I think, had something to say about that to Christians in 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, I want you to think about that. Not a long time ago, before the flood, patriarchal age, I want you to think about Enoch walking with God. And I want you to think about what that meant about the character of that man as he lived according to the truth he had that God gave him in that far off age. How many of us uh, agree with God? A lot of people don't. Amos 3.3 3 reads, can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, can you walk together with God? That's two, you and God. If you're not agreed with submitting to him, I believe from the study of the scriptures that Enoch was one who agreed with God, who submitted to God, who kept God's commandments. God will not be around those. 
God will not companion with those who are not holy. Peter wrote to Christians also in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 again. Brethren, God's made it so we can be holy. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't say, be ye holy, ha, ha, you can't, so you're going to hell. He didn't say that. He's made a system whereby we can be holy. God's not going to be around those who are not righteous. He said to the church in Rome, in Romans 6, 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, think of that walking with God that Enoch did, and you'll see this had to be an integral part of his thinking and actions. God's not going to be around those who are impure. John wrote again to Christians, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. That's a wonderful thing to be able to say that. Now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But what do we know? Well, he says, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope, this expectation of eternal life, of being like him, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Well, for his day and time, I cannot help believe that when I read that he walked with God, that that must have covered his whole attitude and his fellowship and how one today under the gospel system, the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. When we believe and from the heart obey it, Romans 6, 17 and 18, Romans 6, 3 and 4, then the Lord adds us to the church. We're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. The Lord, as I said, adds us to his church. We're born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 3 and 5, Acts 2, 47. We are his. We're children of God. We're new creatures in Christ. Thus we live in fellowship with God and with others who've done likewise. And the last point is his disposition of heart, Enoch's disposition of heart, his inward man. We're talking about his purpose. What is behind one's attitude or his frame of mind or his mindset? Well, I've already mentioned this in the beginning, but here's one thing. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But he doesn't end there. If you go to verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or or whether it be evil. A man living contrary to God's will ought to quake in his boots from his soul out when he hears that until he repents and does what God requires of him. Thus we have in the same line, Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So what focuses our attitude, our disposition of mind, our mindset? Well, Peter tells us, and I won't begin to read all of this, but I will urge you to read it, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. Again, written to Christians for our benefit. He begins in verse 5, and you can get the gist of it. I turn over there and read it. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue into virtue, knowledge and knowledge, temperance, self-control, the temperance, patience. So on down the line. Why is that written? So you can walk with God. That disposition of heart and approach to things must have been Enoch's. Then notice, too, what we have in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. Scripture reads that Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. I said 1 Corinthians, Colossians 2, and verse, uh, 1 in verse 18. Notice that Paul wants Christians to know 
who is the head of all things. Now go with me back to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. I want you to see that because it ties into what I just said. And remember, we're seeing Enoch's walk with God. Very beginning of the the letter to Corinthians. And you begin reading in verse 18. Now remember in Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of all things. If you read on down through there, he's the head of all things. Thus he's the head of the church. Thus he's the savior of the body, verse 18. But now watch here. For the preaching of the cross is of them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. That doesn't mean the delivery. It means the message preached to save them that believe. I'll stop there. Now, we're taking what happened in the long ago patriarchal period to a man who had limited revelation but who walked with God. We're taking that principle and we're bringing it over to today in the Christian age and the church and a person becoming a Christian and a person living the Christian life. And to walk with God today, we've seen, means becoming a Christian. And as a Christian, how we're to walk. Do we have the mindset that we've studied here today? Do we see that this walk with God of Enoch involved his conduct, involved his fellowship, and involved his disposition of heart? So when you read some of these things that seem to be, well, they run, we can run through them pretty fast. You can understand that God then took that man as he was living, walking with God, and just translated him. He didn't see death. He didn't see death. That's an amazing thing. Now, James tells us that the body apart from the spirit is dead. Body's dead. Spirit goes on. But there's no process of dying with Enoch. He just translates him. I've often wondered about that. I still wonder about it. But I know it was because he walked with God and all that implies that God translated him. And it's written there for our learning, Romans 15, 4. So what can I learn about it? That I'm going to be translated and not see death? No, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. It's born unto men wants to die and after that the judgment. But it tells me that I don't have to fear what's going to happen to me at the end of my life. God's going to take care of me. I like to think of the children of Israel when they were crossing to their promised land, the River Jordan. And the priest, who we are in the Christian dispensation as part of the temple of God, the church, we are the priest. Christ is our high priest. And at that time, as the priest bore the Ark of the Covenant between Israel and God, They came upon a raging river for we learned that it was a time of flood stage and they were told to cross it. And those priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, when the soles of their feet touched that water, it all ran off to the south and it built up and stopped here. And as long as those priests stood in the midst of the River Jordan, it all stayed that way. And all of Israel passed over Jordan. Brethren, I think of the time coming when all of us, the Lord does not come back first, must cross the Jordan River. But I know from that shadow of things to come that when my feet, as it were, touch the rolling Jordan River, the gap's going to be opened. And across it we will go because I'm in covenant relationship with God I'm one of his children. I walk with God on this earth. And the only way one can, we walk by faith and not by sight. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That day will come to us all.
And like Lazarus of old, I hope there will be, and I see no reason not to believe it, that a band of angels comes to welcome us and escort us into glory as we cross over Jordan. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, because you're not walking with God, you're not faithful. Obey the Gospels we study. As a child of God, are you walking with God like you ought to and like He expects of you and like you must? Not repent of whatever sin or sins there are that's stopping you. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. You're subject to the blessed call of the wonderful gospel. Come to Jesus to walk with God while together we stand and sing.